your microphone is rubbing on your sweater. How's that better? Yeah, well, we want to see what you're, uh, you look like without the hoodie on. <laughs> I don't have a t- t-shirt on underneath it. I just had the hoodie on over. I'm naked underneath this hoodie. Welcome to Radio Juxtapose, a podcast that goes beyond the clothing complications presented by Zoom recordings and places a gentle ear on the beating heart of the art world. Join us in conversation today with the Detroit-based art publishing house One Time Run. Since 2010, Jesse Corey and Dan Armand have worked to create a global platform connecting artists with an audience. Beyond sales, they've worked behind the scenes on countless projects throughout the US from pop-ups to mural festivals. In an industry that has all too often alienated audiences from the creators they admire, groups like One Time Run have worked to break down those barriers, making the art world the way that it should be, accessible to all. Over the next hour or so, we're going to journey from the physical world into the digital with Jesse and Dan. But with Ukraine on everyone's mind at the moment, Evan picks things up by delving into the world of charity fundraisers. Enjoy the episode. Man, I want to talk about them so bad. I am so ready for this conversation. We are in the thick of it. When something like a war breaks out, in a world, in a part of the world where we kind of, all of us might know some artists. Do you guys go into brainstorming mode about how to perhaps uh, support or think about maybe the artists you've worked with and how to support in in, in a time like this when we have to talk about it? Yeah, no, absolutely. One of the things that we've really struggled with over the last couple of years is using our medium as a fundraising mechanism. And people think like, oh, we'll just put up a print and we'll make money. And the problem is, and we've ran into it a couple of times, is a lot of effort goes into making, distributing, and promoting the product and not much money goes to the charity. So we just decided like last year that anytime somebody would ask us like, hey, I want to do a charity print, that we're just going to donate money directly to a charity. Um, And I thought that was like a more effective way of having like immediate impact. In the case of something like this, what it becomes difficult because I think even with juxtapose, like we're we're trying to work with some artists to help raise some money for the you know Ukrainian effort, and it's like where do you put the money? And that conversation is something I'm sure you guys have had to deal with so many times. And I and I apologize that we're starting like this. I wish we didn't have to start in a way like this, but you guys have been so philanthropic and you've done stuff that's been forward thinking in that way via the vehicle of prints and artists. So I was curious, like what, how, you know, how you decide how to do these kind of things? Sure. I mean, it's hard. And, you know, I think ultimately like last year we ran into a problem where we worked with an agency that wanted to do a fundraising mechanism to support a specific interest. And it ended up costing us more money than we made. Um, And, you know, there's, there wasn't a groundswell of support for the product. So, you know, I think for us as individuals, like when somebody on our teams brings something to us, like, um, a GoFundMe of an artist or, you know, hey, how can we help fundraise for this or that? We've just been dedicating and donating money directly from our either personal or, or, or our business accounts. I think we had a lot of success during the Black Lives Matter um, like movement that was happening during the pandemic where a lot of people were supporting um, artists of color and they were buying um, prints and, you know, donating and all of that. But what we found through that process was just a real change in the way that people perceived art from artists of color. So if you go to pre-pandemic, on one time run was like 10, 12, 14% artists of color. If you go two years later, after we like took a solid look at what we were doing, we said, how can we be more intentional? How can we be more intentional within this group of people? And we now have out of our top 25 artists, um, 12 of them, uh, in the last two years are people of color. So, so, so I think what you look at is like, is there a fundraising mechanism or is it just generally changing your perception on how you support a specific art, art, artist demographic? And I think that's where we've really kind of changed. And I think the market's changed quite dramatically. With everything going on, um, you know, in the world too, it's like, the markets, you see it in the stock market, you see it in the crypto market, like everybody kind of stops investing, stops buying things too. So it also is kind of this, you know, conundrum where people are really stopping their spending, which, you know, kind of prevents you from really 
um, you know, making contributions to those things just kind of, um, you know, naturally. So, yeah. And you guys, you brought it up and this was in my notes. Uh, and then right away you brought it up is like, how do you have a gut check as a company as, as far as you guys have been into it with looking at, you know, your roster of artists or looking at the programs you were doing, because, you know, you're in Detroit, which is like, you know, historically, um, a city of black art and the ability to look at yourself and look at what you're doing and, and make it, make an adjustment or make, you know, open the floodgates or open the doors. Uh, that's also really, um, powerful pivot. And I was curious, like how you guys had to deal with it, but you, you mentioned it. It was something that you guys actually looked at quite, you know, quite intimately. We looked at it from, from, from a pure sales statistics with the e-commerce site. But prior to that, the, our Murals in the Mar- Market project, which is our you know, mural festival that we produced for five years, that was always an intentionally diverse group. And it was intentional that we didn't put the most famous artists as the first billing on the, on the bill. We would put them, all the names would be the same size, all of the, um, they would be alphabetized. So it wasn't like prioritizing them. What we've seen so amazing in our community is that we don't really do that many murals anymore because the artists have their own insurance. Now they know how to make their own murals. They know, you know, um, Roan and Askew and these guys taught them how to do the grid patterns and how to like make large scale murals. So by just affecting or participating and giving people like our shared knowledge of how to like do a mural and then bringing these international artists to our community has created an entire mural economy in Detroit where like last year, um, Sydney James, who was a part of Murals in the Market for many years, started her own mural festival called Blackout Walls, which is it's a, like a majority black run and black led and people call her led organization. And now they're doing one in, 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 um, the, uh, in the Bay Area. So what we're seeing is that what we did intentionally at the very beginning of our, of our trajectory with the mural project, because the city was represented, we wanted to represent the, the makeup of the artists represent the city as we actually feel like that we're at the genesis of creating an entire mural economy in Detroit. Um, and now that's like, you know, sometimes it's a, they say you, you, you plant seeds under which trees you never sit. I think that's, you know, the same on the print side of things, really looking at it analytically and saying like, what have we done historically? And like, where are we at with this whole thing? And then just really setting that intention, you know, and I think uh, it's not something that, you know, every week we're analyzing the numbers and seeing how we're doing, but, you know, intentionally moving in that direction and um, just kind of open our, opening ourselves up. Like you see this kind of natural snowball effect that happens and you start moving down, you know, a different path. We're going to, we're going to get into this kind of historic overview of what one time run is, but how much is Detroit in the DNA of one time run? I mean, I think it's, you know, uh, it's a huge part of the, the DNA and kind of our, um, our drive and our process and, you know, the, the ethos. I think, you know, it's reflected the artists that we work with and the products and stuff that we make is pretty diverse and pretty um, global. But I think at the core of like the mechanics and who we are, and what our kind of philosophies about art are uh, definitely, you know, originate with kind of Detroit and the, the work ethic and the democratic nature and the low, you know, the kind of value we try to bring. It's, it's all really baked into it. Yeah. Cause I was thinking about the fact that you guys sort of, to me as, as somebody who does not live in Detroit, but you guys represent kind of um, with, with one time run and with interstate and the murals in the market and all the, the, the stuff you guys do with music, everything you sort of represent the kind of revitalization of the art community there. And it seems like that is such an important conversation, especially when you're talking about the fact that you guys are dealing with emerging artists. Like there's a lot of connections between all these different things. Because when you started, Detroit still wasn't quite on the map. No, no. I mean, it was definitely a place that you knew artists kind of wanted to come just because of the opportunity and uh, just kind of the nature, the wild west nature of it. You know, we didn't come from a place where we had a bunch of money to start this. We didn't have a network of rich collectors. We didn't have any of that. We kind of started with with nothing and really wanted to make uh, and, and produce the art that, like, we could afford to buy, you know, and the, the stuff we were into, which was Shepard Fairy prints. And, you know, uh, we really tried to create things that people could afford to really 
um, open it up to a whole new group of like fans and collectors that wanted to be a part of this art movement, but didn't come from the art world necessarily, or didn't have a background in collecting or weren't rich people, you know? So we really kind of, I don't know, created this working class art brand. I think we, well, also you guys were providing a service that wasn't being done, which was, I mean, at least not being done really well in the United States, especially was that you were taking street art, which is hard to collect because it's on the street and making it collectible in a way that was actually accessible to the actual audience that was enjoying it, which is a really important part of the, how the street art movement has grown is that it's through people like one time run and pictures on walls and is making something that was unattainable in terms of being collectible, actually attainable to the people that were enjoying it. So it's, it's so it's part of the DNA of, of street art culture, really. And I know you guys do more than street art, but that or, the origins of it feel like it comes from that ethos. Well, absolutely. I mean, I remember there was some point it was like, you know, even some people that were like, you know, um, donning bandanas and street art names were like, you know, big sellers at the very beginning because there was this mystery of, you know, the, the movement, obviously, you, you know, people were using, you know, pseudonyms and stuff like that. So it, it, it really was, uh, you know, I think Dan mentioned like Detroit's in our DNA. We're hard, we're hardworking. We grind it out. I mean, we're into, we're moving into our 12th year this year and in, in November. And it's just like, it, I just feel like sometimes we're like the little caboose that could. And, you know, even when we're counted out or we've struggled, um, we've been able to kind of continue to kind of pump out, art prints and releases and collections of original art. And it was really interesting because, you know, we're talking about it the other day. I feel like we're the artists we work with are like on an escalator and they start at the very bottom of the escalator. And as they go up, you know, and then they kind of like rise and then they kind of get off at the top. And then it's like, okay, we got to start over, you know, and somebody gets back on the escalator and they start riding up because once they reach a point where they're, they've, you know, they're doing a really substantial amount of business. They usually hire an assistant, which, you know, not only can help them pack their prints, uh, but, you know, do all the other stuff in the studio, answer emails, like all of the functions of an art, of an artist, you know, um, back in the back office of an artist's world. So we provide those key functionalities, you know, financing, production management, shipping, fulfillment, customer service, like all of those things that we do. But at some point, they don't need us to do them for them anymore. I think even with the first release we did, you know, we had this, you know, we had started this little gallery. Uh, we didn't have a huge following. I mean, nobody really knew it, knew us outside of Detroit. We didn't have a big audience on the online, you know, um, or a print market or anything like that. But and even the way we built the mechanics of the site where we only, you know, um, put these prints up for a certain amount of time and only made what was there. Like we tried to create the same kind of scarcity dynamics for anybody in the same way you would have if you were a, a major artist selling, you know, 400 prints out in a minute. Like we tried to engineer all those things so that everybody kind of had somewhat of the same playing field kind of through that gamification of the art too. So, um, you know, that was really our attempt to, to kind of take some of these emerging lesser known artists and give them the same scarcity and time and, and demand and all that stuff too. So what cultures did you guys come from before you got into the art world? Like what was the things that were kind of like germinating in your lives that led to starting something like this? I mean, for me, it was uh, I think what led me directly here was graffiti. And, you know, I started writing graffiti when I was in high school, um, you know, in and around Detroit. I, you know, I was always kind of um, artistic and into creative things growing up. I had an art, art artist grandfather, you know, uh, very traditional, but I was always kind of around that and, uh, you know, decided to pursue that and went to art school where that's when days of just like doing toy tags all over the the neighborhood kind of changed to like meeting real writers and you know really kind of discovering this whole international world that was out there and a local scene in Detroit really kind of taking it super serious and that's kind of how I met Jesse too when we first met he was working on a, a graffiti documentary back in was that 2000 and two or 2003, something like that. And uh, they actually interviewed me for the film and, and we became friends with that. So, um, you know, graffiti is definitely at the core of 
Well, we have to talk about this because Detroit, I mean, everybody is, uh, their understanding of, of graffiti or the, of the culture of Detroit, especially around that time or in the 90s and early 2000s was a city that had been, um, had infrastructure that was abandoned. And so there was a lot of empty space. But oh, I also assume that the graffiti scene was probably quite uh, localized and quite vibrant, but maybe I got that wrong. Yeah, no, I mean, it was super localized, but it had, you know, a, a super vibrant community that also, you know, it was really following what, you know, other big areas were doing and kind of the code of the streets and all the, what was at the core of, of every graffiti movement, I think was here too. And there were some major writers that were starting to build connections with people out of town. Um, and it was really kind of around that time for me that, you started to have like Midwest guys coming into town and you started having, you know, some LA people and screw and, and KR had some pieces here. And there were some people that like pretty big people that were kind of coming in and, and sneaking in and doing their thing. And I think that just, um, you know, kind of just in the way we see what the mural festivals do for teaching young people and kind of creating that culture was doing the same thing here. Um, but I mean, there were some amazing places where it was just, you know, the old bombed out yards and the train yard, which is now uh, the DeQuinter cut, which is like this beautiful kind of walking path through Detroit used to be like this hot spot. And there was the writer's bench of Detroit. And we all kind of met there and clicked up and, you know, admired each other's pieces and kind of tried out to each other. It was a super exciting time in the city. You know, you didn't have a, a mayor who really was interested in doing anything with graffiti at the time. So it was bombed out here and it was you know, you could not escape it. It was everywhere. It just started to stack up. And I think then that was really the point where, you know, you started having message boards and um, really the light started. There was a, an outlet for Detroit graffiti to be shown to the rest of the world. And I think that's kind of what opened the door. People were like, oh, shit, we got to go to Detroit. Like, Jesse, first off, where is this graffiti documentary now? And like, how did you get into doing like that? Like, what got you into it? Yeah. So when I was in high school, my dad was a volunteer at the local television community access station. We started like letting us take the equipment home, which was like a camcorder over your shoulder and then the, or a VCR on your shoulder and a camcorder that you held. And we would um, make our own like little shows and, and, and have fun. And so we were, you know, creating um, characters and we were creating, you know, scenes and we were creating, we were just being creative and, and all in, a, in an act of rebellion. Um, because our, our show is based around um, a character who would go interview people in the ghetto and then they would like get killed. It, the serial serial killer meets, you know, um, serial killer meets like Guar, I guess, if you would, because the, the you know, it's like an art rock band, you know, it's kind of like our, you know, it was like the punk rock mentality of that. So so when I when I end up uh, leaving um, Detroit and I moved to New York City, I was working in film and television. I came back to Detroit and was working on this graffiti documentary that never really seen the light of day, but there's, I mean, hundreds of hours of footage. Wait, why aren't you putting that out? What's going on? Well, it's a little dispute there with the, uh, you know, the director. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I don't know. I mean, Dan and I fantasize about it all the time as, as, as releasing it. So, I mean, I have the tapes in my, and the edit in my basement and I, I'll dig it out, but it was called um, Paint Cans and Politics. It's actually, I feel like I watch it about once every like two or three years because I have a cut where it wasn't the final cut. It never really got to the final, final cut, but it's pretty close. And, it, you know, the more I watch it now, it's even more relevant today because you see, I mean, Kwame Kilpatrick, of, you know, he was the mayor at the time. And, you know, everyone knows he went to jail for uh, corruption and, and the current mayor, Mike Duggan, was the the former prosecutor so he was a character in the story and it's actually when you watch it now it's like wow this you know it, it's pretty crazy but yeah i never really saw the light of day outside of you know a few people who got the the dvds the sneak peek yeah well you, you guys need to do like the peter jackson thing where he took all the let it be uh footage for the beatles and like re and remat like redid it recently that and now it's like uh it's not it's it's less about them hating each other it's about them sort of working together it's kind of you know you might need to have a little outside uh, edit on it yeah no we had a lot of fun I mean so my background was in storytelling essentially you know I worked in documentaries um I worked on capturing the Freedmans which was nominated for an Oscar in 2001 I worked on that film 
um, worked on a bunch of a bunch of documentaries in New York. And then I came back and I was just in the storytelling business, you know? And so when I started a small marketing agency, we were just telling stories through marketing and we were using video and the internet to do that. And so it was a real natural progression when we when Dan and I kind of teamed up and started 323 East, our first art gallery, you know, we were just like there every night from like five o'clock to midnight, just grinding after work. And we just had a natural knack for telling stories. I think what really taught us how to become like from a, we were like an art boutique to where we became an art gallery is that we went to New York and like went to a Jonathan Levine show. I think it was D face show that was, that he had there. And I was just like, I grabbed like the press release and I was like, I grabbed the flyers and I was like, okay, I got home and I was like, this is how we're going to do it. This is how they do their press releases. This is how they do their flyers. This is how they do their shows. And then, you know, Glenn Barr knocked on the door one day and he goes, hey man, this place is pretty groovy. And we're like, uh, Dan's like, you know who that is, right? And I was like, well, not really. And Dan's like, dude, that's like the OG. OG Detroit legend. Yeah. yeah. And so Glenn just like came in and we were kind of like an art boutique. We had like t-shirts and jewelry. It was all made by, you know, local crafters. And Glenn was like, Hey, can you take this shelf down? And he was like, Hey, do you mind if I put some art over there? And by the end of it, it was a white wall boxed gallery. Everything. Yeah. Our whole boutique was down. It was just, you know, Glenn's painting. So we're like, well, we're a gallery. We're in a car gallery we now. Glenn <laughs> we got Glenn Barr in here. Like we're legit, you know? <laughs> I love the, I love the this thread because there's something that I wanted to touch on that you guys do such a good job and I mean, this is the origins of it. You guys are storytellers. Like you do a really great job of like when you're putting out a print, especially when you guys put out like a, a particular like suite of prints where it's based around a story. Like you guys really really do make it feel as if it's such a cohesive tale that you're telling. And that's been something that I think why you guys have lasted as long as you've lasted with this particular one time run is because there is you guys are you really are telling a story with these releases in a way it's very unique and in a time when people don't have the attention span it's still it's it's very palpable what you guys are doing but that makes sense because you guys join together trying to make a story yeah it's so it's so natural yeah. it's very natural for us like i mean i think when you look at two like you know, Dan, when, when we were working at the gallery, Dan was doing email marketing for Ford Motor Company. And I was doing lead generation for like um, windows and home improvement companies. So we were like, how do you take email marketing and how do you take lead generation? And how do we take those things and like put them around art? So we were like, if we can get a lot of email addresses and we can send compelling emails, that's all these people are doing in these markets. They're telling stories to consumers about their product. We could just put something in there that we were passionate about. And, you know, One Time Run was born. What was the first One Time Run product? It was uh, the older brother of uh, Tristan. That was, that was run number 0001. <laughs> but before that, we had made, we worked with the Detroit Electronic Music Festival, which was now called Movement. We worked with the Movement Festival to create uh, posters, uh, prints with um, the rock poster artist, Mark Arminsky. And then when Glenn did his show, Glenn taught us how to do a print. Um, and then we started giving away small little eight, uh, four by eight prints for people to line up in front of the gallery for our art shows. So we can be like, oh, look, at there's a line outside. So we were using print medium and we were, Glenn actually introduced us to his G clay printer. This guy, Tom Dunstan, he had been making prints for years and he just taught us, he had a G clay printer and he just taught us how to do that. And then we were making screen prints too. I think this is where I think people need a tutorial because everybody, when they buy prints, they want to understand like, what is it that they're buying? Like, what is it, like, what does it mean to buy an edition print? Like why, why are certain ones so expensive? Why, why are ones, you know, like how I'm curious about like how give, give us a little tutorial about like how, how a print is made by one time run. There's ways we kind of do it mechanically, you know, as part of like the process, but there's still always so many unknowns because it's so subjective and uh, the medium could be, you know, a wide range of things and what, try, you know, what story are we trying to tell and what was, what is the piece, you know, the artist is trying to make? Is it, you know, did they have a hit with this painting? They want to reproduce the painting or is it something, a fresh idea that, you know, they kind of want to create and have a, a more hand created approach, like a screen print. I mean, I think it all really kind of, I don't know, it's hard for me to give a, a tutorial on the, the general dynamics of it, but it's all really um, 
you know, it's how we tell that story of what that artist wants to make. And I think the, the way we started doing the, the G clays was just kind of the easiest way for us to reproduce a painting as the artist created it and put that out, you know? So that's kind of the, um, you know, what we would do the most of, but I mean, you know, since then we, we work with so many vendors and processes, and, um, you know, all over the place. So if the artist has a certain vision for what they want to make, like we'll have somebody here that can make that, or we have somebody, you know, in Europe that can do that kind of print to match, you know, what they're going for. So, I mean, the process really starts with the curation of it and working with the artist. Like, what are we making? Why are we making it? What do we want this to be? It's almost like working backwards from there. Yeah, exactly. I was, I was just going to, just going to say that working backwards. Do you, I'm sure you prefer to have the artist's hand or the artist there or the artist really, really present while it's being made because there is like, it's, there's crafts people who help make the artist's vision happen. And there's that kind of conversation is like why people go to art school for printmaking, like these kind of conversations and like fostering that is also part of the story. In 2017, we moved to a new facility. Um, in our previous facility, when we were at Interstate Gallery, we had full printing capabilities in our basement. We had a screen printing shop. We had a master printer. We had three full-time people that worked in the print shop. We were bringing artists into our residency, and they were just making all this stuff in our basement. And that had a certain frequency to it, a feel, a sound, you know, uh, a vibe, right? And when and we had our a full uh, G-Clay studio. What we found ourselves doing is we, we had a hard time doing the marketing and the production and the, and the manufacturing at the same time. So we moved to a new facility, uh, a, more, a bigger warehouse that was a little bit more conducive to our, our business model in 2018. At that point, we decided to outsource everything. So we outsource all of the printing. We have one printer in-house now. We just can make samples on it. But essentially, like we now use a whole host of different printers. So what I tell artists now and what our product is like today, which is not the product that we made when we were at 1410 Gratiot, um, where Interstate was, is we, it's like, I tell them that we're going to go to different recording studios and we're going to make an album. And we're going to make it in different recording studios. And each recording studio is going to have their own sound, their own frequency, their own style. So for instance, there's um, a printer in Minneapolis, St. Paul that does foil stamping. We work with a printer in um, Southern California called Calibre. This guy's a master printer. He makes Bob Dylan's prints um, and he has these very special methodologies and he can print very big. Um, we use Bicep Press. They're in Bristol. Um, we use local printers. We actually have a, like a, a print shop in town that makes screen prints that is a volunteer-based print shop. And they have a different frequency to their prints. Um, we have a printer in over in Madison, Wisconsin, and he has a different frequency to his print. So like the best thing would be for us to lay a plan out for an artist, say, all right, we're going to work what we're going to do for the next year. We're going to do acid blotters with Zane Kesey. We're going to do a skateboard with our skateboard vendor. We're going to do a print in Bristol with Bicep Press. We're going to do a foil print with the printer in, in, in Minneapolis. So by the end, you have this collection of prints that are so dynamically different, but yet have the same tonality of the artist. And that's a body of work in itself. I love that. that I love that metaphor. And I know because you guys do a lot of stuff with music, but that like, going to different recording studios to make a track, that is such a good metaphor and way to understand like, what it is that you guys are doing. And, and it's also a really great way of explaining it to the artist as well, because that, that's not necessarily how they get to work. And then they, but now they do. And it's like they are making it. This is, again, it goes back to the, the fact that you guys are doing stories. It really it goes back into that. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, when we had the studio and the residency, like it was amazing just being able to work with all these artists that would come into town and we're making everything there. I mean, it was hard to run that kind of the production side of that business, you know, the actual business of it. And we found ourselves like not everybody fits into, you know, that mold. And there were so many people we were working with and wanted to work with, like, you know, how do we, how do we make what, make that song that, you know, the way you want to hear it basically, you know? So I think that was just opening ourselves up to like, who is the best at making this? Who is the best at making that? Who's the best at making this and just working with everybody, you know? And I think 
not only is that good to kind of let us focus more on the storytelling and the curation, but it's also like supporting a wider creative community and all the vendors and, you know, kind of everybody in the space that touches it. Like it, I think it's really cool to, um, you know, kind of support that, uh, support something bigger than, you know, just our business. It's like a real economy. What did you guys lose in the pandemic? Well, a lot of the creative service side of our business, which was mural based and, You know, we had a bunch of office buildings and corporate projects for stuff like that. And all their marketing budgets went to zero and all the in-person stuff stopped. And everybody put that on the back burner. You know, I think when when those stimmies went out, print sales went up for a little while. But yeah, I mean, we lost a lot of the kind of in-person, you know, activations that we had planned out for the whole year. So it was tough. But I think we gained, we gained like, personal connections with artists that we never had before because of the use of video. Yeah. Like, I don't even think I knew what half the artists looked like that we worked with because it was just email. That's interesting. In a a world where we were separated, you guys actually found better connections. That's actually a really, that's funny way of thinking about it. Not a funny way of thinking about it. It's like the reality of thinking about it. It's what happened. Yeah. I felt more, I, I felt more inclined to have a chat with somebody than I ever did before. The reason why I want to bring this up is because I feel like what you guys always had was this community of people. Like when I've come to Detroit and I come by, it's like, it feels like there's always something happening. There's people kind of coming in and out. And it's like, you guys had this, it's like a hub. And when, if you lost that, like how do you keep it going while putting out a product that people are actually buying probably more of because people were sitting around their houses, looking at their walls and wanting stuff. So you had to kind of figure out a new way to build a community or keep that energy going, I should say. Look, you know, when you've been in business, in the same business for, you know, over a decade, like you've, you've shed many skins and you've gone through many metamorphoses and you've had different, different eras of your, of your creativity and your output. So, you know, like yesterday was the first time that I can remember that two artists were in our space at the same time. And it was kind of amazing. Like two weeks ago, we started working back in the office kind of organically. We just all kind of just showed up one day. But, you know, we also, you know, um, last May opened up a new gallery with my wife, Rula David. It's called Spotlight and it's a music venue and it's a coffee shop. So we share the same space with that. So much like we used to have a gallery, now we just have a coffee shop with people co-working and hanging out. There's a record store, but we haven't we haven't been back enough to kind of intermingle a lot. But the, the idea is that a gallery in its form of commoditized art is only a place for people of visual art to gather. And a cafe uh, is a place for um, all um, likes of creativity, visual, music, you know, spoken word, you know, activism, all of these different creativities can guide a kind of interact with the record store and the coffee shop and it's a gallery and at night it's more of a music venue. So, you know, I just think it's like this kind of, you know, it's like a snowball that we just kind of keep rolling down the hill. Yeah. Well, and you know, like Jesse said with the, you know, meeting more people and have more conversations on zoom. I mean, you see all these new technologies kind of springing up too, like discords and places where like, we're not interacting in person. Like how do we interact better within, you know, our digital communities. You're listening to Radio Juxtapose, Evan Preco in conversation with Jesse and Dan from One Time Run, still to come on today's episode. We don't know what your print is going to be worth in the future, and we don't know how your NFT is going to be used in the future. That's right. we got NFTs in the agenda. Let's get back into it right now on Radio Juxtapose. Do we want to talk about NFTs? Man, I want to talk about them so bad. I am so ready for this conversation. We are in the thick of it. (laughs) It is the most... I feel like that we are sailors. We're getting on a boat and we're going to go find a new land. That's what it feels like. It feels so fresh, so new, and so inspiring. And the ideas are so dynamic. And the way that smart contracts can communicate an artist vision is only being tapped slightly today and will be so dynamically tapped in the future that creativity will be 
a, there'll be an opportunity of creativity that's never been harnessed before. The way that you looked on your face when I brought it up, I was not sure if that's what your response was going to be. It feels much like it did when we first started making prints and first started opening an art gallery. And it's like the world is ours and there's all this potential. And we can do anything we want. We can do this. I mean, it, from an energy standpoint, it, it's definitely um, kind of renewed us in a lot of ways because, uh, you know, after 12, 10 years of making art prints, 12 years where we're at now, um, you know, you kind of get into a rhythm and you, there's process and you get excited about projects. But I think what we see with, you know, this whole NFT uh, movement and the development of these technologies, it's like, it's, it's at a simple point now in a lot of respects of, you know, uh, digital art for sale as a token, but I think underlying it, having a business that's based around physical art, but also somewhat the technology of selling that art, like we, I feel like, you know, we understand and at least can really see the crazy amount of potential that this has. I mean, it's not just selling paintings as JPEGs, you know what I mean? There is uh, an ownership that the artist can have. Um, I mean, there is just the technical possibilities and the things you can create. I mean, it's, it's almost unlimited. And I think you know, in a lot of ways of how we release prints and we have this secondary market of collectors that buy and sell on eBay or buy and sell here. Like once we ship a print, it's over for the most part. You may see somebody that collected a print in a gallery show sometime. And they're like, Hey, I bought this print from you seven years ago. I love it. But you don't, it's, it's over at that point where now it's like you are connected to it. The artist is connected to it. You can see what happens and the artist can still benefit from that sale um, you know, in perpetuity and always know who their collectors are and always be able to reach them. And it's amazing. I mean, it's, you know, you sell 50 prints by one artist, they go all over the place. And those people have no connection to each other, except maybe they follow the artists on Instagram. Whereas now they're all in a discord and they're all friends. Now they're all talking about this and supporting that and helping to build, uh, you know, even more community around that project they're supporting. So I mean, just from that standpoint alone, it's amazing. I think I haven't seen too many NFT type projects that I'm like really excited about because I think the technology hasn't been tapped in the way it's going to be really interesting for everybody. And it, when it does, when, the, when artists start actually figuring out how to use this medium, it's going to be so much fun to see what happens. But I think right now, I think we're all agree. It's kind of like it's at the precipice of something that's really, that's going to be really exciting. And like, it's a new tool. It's like the, it's like the printing press, it's like a new tool now. Let's see what everybody, how everybody uses it. I was on the phone with Kid Acme as I drove into the studio today. And I was telling him like, so when you make a print and, and a collector invests in it, they're hoping that the utility, utility of that a physical art print is that you will continue to grow your art career. You will continue to build value in that print and that print will hold its value, right? That's the utility of an art print. I'm buying your art prints. I'm supporting your career. And you, in turn, you're going to continue to push your career forward to build value in my art prints. Like if I bought your art print and then you quit painting, then my art print's worth nothing, right? So that's the utility of a physical art print. The utility of an NFT collectible right now is that we don't really know how it may be used in the future. So we were talking about creating these wheat paste from his first stabby, um, stabby woman character. And he said, when I first started doing it, I was making wheat paste. And I was putting them up all over Europe and Brazil. And, and I was like, why don't we make NFTs of the wheat paste? Because like in the future, like, will you be able to take that NFT and put wheat paste in your metaverse? I don't know. I mean, people are selling NFT jerseys and maybe you can wear those and NFT sneakers and maybe you can put them on your avatar. So the, the ability to right now is that you're going to put stuff out in the universe. You're not really sure how people will use it in the future. But what the collector understands is that they're getting it on the ground floor and that they believe that you will continue to build value and the utility in the future, just like you would in a traditional art career. That's a good way. Of, I think it's a very... Um... That's a very simplistic way for people to understand what's happening. We don't know what your print is going to be worth in the future. And we don't know how your NFT is going to be used in the future. 
But we know that if I'm going to make an investment into you, that I'm investing in somebody that's going to keep working hard for it. So we did um, a PFP NFT project with Ron English called the Light Cult Crypto Club. Yep. But we didn't really know, like we just started it and we were like, what's the utility? And this is like a buzzword. And it's like, then we were like, well, we, Ron made all these sketches. So why don't we make scavenger hunts and people who got the NFT can get the original sketch. And like, they're like, oh damn, this thing has utility. You know, then he came out with a, a Nike sneaker with Kevin Durant and it had the like call logo on it. And it was like, oh my God, that's utility. And it's like, we didn't know utility. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of a terrible term in the industry, right? But what you realize is people convey that to value is you're going to continue to put value into this. And that's all you want with an artist's career. Like if I know that you're hitting with a major collector, or you're going to be in a major auction house, that's value for my, the, what, I've, what I've already invested in your career as a traditional, traditional artist. So I think they run quite parallel. NFTs are still so new and people, you know, it swings so dramatically and people worry, did I just make a bad investment? Did I do this? Well, we built in like, okay, well, you could take that NFT and you can burn it and get rid of it forever and get a physical print for that if you're done with the NFT. So there's like, there is value in that because you know that a Ron English print is worth a lot of money. So having worked with so many artists and understanding um, like longevity and their careers and respecting like their art and their markets and all that stuff, I mean, that's always going to be the goal for us in this NFT space is how we, how we build this utility and value into it. You know, it's, we're not just trying to, uh, there's so many people out there getting rich selling the craziest stuff. And it's like, I, you know, we were reluctant on the NFT space for a long time. Cause I just coming from this physical traditional art world, like I couldn't wrap my head, even though I've been in crypto for years before, I couldn't understand the value and how, this made sense, you know, until I really understood the technology behind it and the possibilities of it. And then, you know, that's like, okay, well, we can, um, we can put the artist first and really, uh, you know, harness this to support them, you know, for a long time. So really what this is a conversation too about is that you have an audience and collector base and people who follow you that trust you guys. And that's, where the 12 years comes in. And I think that's why, you know, even though we, we had a lot of people talking to us about NFTs well before NFTs really blew up, you know, last year and kind of became somewhat mainstream, I guess, you know, and people were kind of pushing us to get in that space and we we're a little reluctant and, um, you know, still like as many artists as we work with, a lot of them still aren't totally sold on NFTs either. Or don't totally understand it. Um, which I get. And I think, you know, we could have taken any artists and thrown up some, you know, NFTs and tried to make a quick buck and capitalize on it. But I think we've, I think it's been good having this traditional background and looking at it from that side, because we want to make sure that whatever we do, you know, that you people's because we know people have the trust with us. The customers have it and the artists have it. And we don't want to um, do anything to kind of break that trust for anybody. So we're really looking at it as like, um, you know, everybody sees the money that's being made in NFTs. I'm sure that's, you know, maybe a hope in the long run. But I think for our side, it's really like um, making something that, benefits everybody and benefits, you know, this art community as a whole. Is this the most excited that you guys have been in terms of a new platform since you started? Yeah. So we, we started um, in, in January, we were working with a partner and we created our own NFT platform. It's one X run dot limited. And so the goal is that you buy a traditional print on our dot um, com, and then you will receive a claim for a uh, companion NFT. So the idea is that 99% of artists and 99% collectors are not in the NFT space. So you can buy it with your credit card, you can get a print and you can receive an NFT. And then our, uh, our NFT website dot limited um, will actually create a wallet for you and then put your NFT in your wallet for you. So it's, you know, it's very easy and it's, you know, there's no burden, there's no barrier to entry. And I kind of look at it like, 
Well, at one time I didn't have a pager and one time I didn't have a cell phone. And one time I didn't really have a, I didn't have a crypto wallet, right. Or an NFT wallet. And so, you know, and now I do. And I think that we'll continue to like um, onboard people into that. But what we did is we gave out 500 Genesis cards and basically it's like your one X run VIP VIP card. card. We gave out 500 of them. And then what we're doing is we're calling them rare drops. And so the first Friday of each month, if you're a Genesis card holder, you get a rare drop. And so the first rare drop was a series of three images and three colorways by Naturel. So a, a sequence of nine. And out of those, uh, you're likely to get the one colorway is 5%. The rare colorway is 5%. And then the common is a 30% chance to get it. So we've kind of created this. So, so then we're creating through this rare drop, um, a value based on scarcity. And so then we have a secondary market. And yes, uh, just this week, somebody bought a Genesis card for $1,000. So somebody believes that there's value in the Genesis card because now they're getting these 12 rare drops that we've committed to. And then the second release was with Denial and we did 10 of his like uh, luxury drugs, luxury goods as these um, shelf medication. They're, they're pers- pills, right? Um, and so we, you know, there's a scarcity, like the most rare one is there's 30 and then the most, uh, common one is a hundred. And so people are like, Oh my God, I got a rare one. And then somebody went on our marketplace and bought an entire set. So there's somebody that completed a full set of NFTs. So what you're seeing is that because we're, and we're talking about this too, we have a print release. So instead of saying, well, if you want the can embellished version, you have to pay double or triple. We're saying, hey, we're just going to add the hand embellished versions into the, when we do a print in a companion NFT, we're going to say 10% of people are going to get the rare NFT randomly. And 10% of the people are going to get the, the, the hand embellished physical print randomly. So it's like, it adds this whole new layer where before it was like, well, if you want the rare one, you pay more. Now it's just saying, hey, we're going to treat every sale as the same. And we're going to randomly give people more value. What you're also doing here and I can, I seriously, I can hear, I can see, I can hear your enthusiasm about this. But what you're doing is you're looking out for the artists. You're allowing the artists to feel as if they're supported going into this new frontier, and you're doing a lot of the legwork for them. And that's how you keep these. This is how you keep a business. I mean, obviously, how you keep business going. But this is how you keep the artists will feel supported, and that's what this is all about. Is that you're making, you're giving them opportunities, which is something that. The prints did because at the time you guys started the brand, the prints were something that all our artists were trying to figure out how to tap into that market. Now you're giving them the, the, the foundation to make the next step. I was hanging out with Revoke a couple of years ago and we were having this conversation. Like you need all layers of the mark of, of the industry. You need assistants, you need administrators, you need art dealers, you need gallerists, you need, you know, uh, accounting people like, you know, and so, and you need people like, you need people that are at the upper echelons of society and you need people at the entry level of the market. So there's all of those dynamics that go into a market. That's what we've always fulfilled. I think as a business is that we fulfilled this, what this tranche of the market that says you need help with facilitation, ideation, execution. We have a team, all of those things. And so you know, just applying that now, like Dan said, to this NFT market. And I'm telling you, Evan, this market is like a thousand times bigger than the art market. And we've been trying to grow the art market, right? One time run has modest gains year over year and in, in its gross revenue, but it's not exponential. It's not a hockey stick business, right? But when we look at the NFT market, it's like now comic book collectors, stamp collectors, uh, finance people, like they're all getting into this market and they're saying, oh, wow, yeah, Ron English. Yeah, he has legacy. Oh, you know, and it's funny because there's no Venn diagram that says that your collectors and our collectors know each other. There's nothing. It's not saying like, oh, well, we have we share collectors with juxtaposed like or fans or whatever. It's like there's an artist that has a million followers that I've never heard of who's making a great career for his whole industry. So there's no, there's not a lot of overlap, right? So when we look at like, when we sold eight, 9,000 NFTs for the like crypto club to, I think there's about 1500 customers. 
like maybe there's some people that came from VV, which Ron has NFTs on VV. There's people that came from One Time Run. There's people that came from Propaganda. There's people that came from his social media. And then there's all these people that we connected with through Twitter. A lot of people didn't even know who Ron was. And they didn't even know who Ron was. And they're just like, okay. And so the thing is, like, I think having legacy and history provides value when people start to open the Pandora's box. They start to say, Oh, wow. Okay. So I'm not just like Johnny come lately. Cause we look at other NFT projects and we're like, wow, this guy is really had really smart about it. Well, yeah. Guy also has a crazy market. We've never heard of that person before. What was the, what was the best decision you guys made early on? And what was the worst decision that you guys made early on? Powwow, man. Powwow. Powwow. Like we went to the second Powwow Hawaii And, you know, I knew Australia and he was working with Jasper and, you know, Dan just went out there on a whim and we, we were working on prints with like woes and, and, and a couple other artists. And, you know, we just took the prints out there that we had had, we didn't really make anything new and we did a little print signing, but what was that space like when you guys got there? Hey, yeah, it was just like a, uh, an old rundown, like, room that you know they were storing stuff in it looked like for like the last 15 years or something you know it didn't even have lights it didn't have plumbing nothing you know it was just like jasper's like hey come out to hawaii Maybe we could do something we show up and you know there's this like storage space and we spent like three or four days just like building this space out and throwing an art show with like 10 prints in it you know but then there was like all these people the place was packed and we're in hawaii you know uh and there's all these people painting murals and incredible experience overall. You know? What was the moment where you guys are like, Oh my God, we almost fucked this up. Man, I think it was when we hit like 25 employees, it was like, you know, they start like, if we had, we had three people in this print shop and three people in that print shop. We had two people work for our art gallery. We were doing art fairs. Like we just got so overextended. We ran out of money. Like it was just like, we were going in every direction, like doing two, three art fairs a year, running a gallery, running the print shop, running a, a, a artist in residency, you know, and trying to just like maintain everything. Like it was really tough for us. I mean, we were like, I mean, we went from like nothing to millions of dollars of revenue, like in a matter of like 18 months. And it was just, and we just like, I hired every person that I met, like came in the gallery. I was like, can you pack prints today? And they're like, yes. I'm like, can you start now? They're like, yes. Can I, can I pay you cash $10 an hour? Yes. And then it was like, then it was like, oh, we need health insurance. And it was like, oh, you know, like we need to pay for email addresses. And it was like, Oh, then you have to have vacation time and 401k. And it was just like, and then it was like, Uh, oh, yeah. Then all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're like a quasi therapist for, you know, all the employees and this person's got a problem here. This guy is, this person has an issue. And it's like, then you really, I think we started to get far away from what we kind of love doing, which was making the art, telling the story. And we're managing a lot of people, you know, to do that. So you know, I feel, I feel like we're in the right spot where we can be hands on and, and connect to what we're making and talk to the artists. And that's where I feel really. Yeah, it's like kind of felt like like we had this like hidden office and it had this door that was closed all the time. And it was just like we were just like making decisions and like looking at the numbers. And I don't know. You know, it's so funny because I think like two, two or three years ago, we started hiring like all these consultants. And it was like, this person's like a click consultant. And this person's like a lead conversion consultant. And then this person's like a Google Analytics consultant. And then we, you know, firing people because like the product doesn't convert on like traditional like Facebook advertising. And we're getting frustrated. And I was like, I'm done. I only care about one thing. This is our one metric. Did it sell out or did it not? I mean, we don't even look at Google Analytics. I don't even know how many people went to our website in the last year. I used to look at it every day. We hired consultants to like break it down for us. And they were like, always like, could you create this hockey stick business? Could you grow and grow and grow? And I think when you look at like, you know, even 20 by 200, which, you know, back in like the mid 2000s had like $10 million in investment funding. And they ended up like having a coup and like kicking out the CEO and all this stuff. So like, we've never taken on investment. We tried. Um, We've never had any like, you know, real 
exponential growth. It's always kind of been like it's very working class. You know, we tried I and mean, we thought, yeah, we could grow this business to an exponential business and maybe find an exit. But it's never been about that um, for us. Like, and so I think that's why when we transition over to the NFT side, we're like, we could make the working class, the working artist NFT platform. And we can have modest success and the artist can get into a market and we don't know where that's going to lead us to. Just much like when we released our first print, we didn't know the utility that that print would have and that somebody would go and sell that print for 10 times its value through an auction house. Or as of next week, um, you know, some of the stuff that we made with Ricky Powell, rest in peace, is going to be in the Sotheby's hip hop auction. You know, so it's like you just have to plant the seeds and watch things grow. And that's where we're at is we're just like planters, you know, just keep planting seeds. And then, you know, some trees you sit under and most you don't. And, and that's took completely, completely fine for us. I think we had to go through a couple of years of therapy, <laughs> but, you know, we, we made it out of that and then, and we're better of it. And I think Dan and I are like, not only are we, you know, best friends, you know, our families share, share time together and we, we have a tremendous amount of love for each other. Um, it's because we've gone through all these struggles and, um, and we've been honest with each other. And, and I think that's been, you know, the most rewarding part of this journey is, is, uh, is my friendship with Dan and our relationship. I mean, we could end there because that was amazing. But I have to ask, I mean, it was such a good way of summing up the brand, really. That right there was so good. But I have to ask, like, what, um, what artists have your juices flowing right now that you guys are excited to work with or are excited that you're about to work with? Like who, give me a couple names just so our listeners, the radio jokes with podcast can be prepared to spend some money with you, man. Dude, Chiefy McFly from Detroit is been just an uh, absolutely amazing, amazing collaborator. He used to come to our gallery and he'd be like, yo, put me on. And so if you go back to our beginning of his page on our website, you can see some of his early works. They were rough, right? And he would come to the gallery and he would hang out and he was like, yo, mural festival, put me on the mural festival. So we're like, all right, we put all the locals on, you know, it's like arbitrary, uh, subjective if, if it's good or not, right? It's just art, right? Do you like it? Maybe somebody does it, else does it. It doesn't really matter. We are curators of people, not of their, not of the actual art because it didn't really matter. It's, you know, and so Chiefy calls me about three years ago and he got back from Art Basel, maybe 2019 or something. And he says, hey, I went to Art Basel and I, I got a lot of ideas. He goes, can, you, can we get breakfast? And so we're sitting at breakfast and he goes, I'm ready. I said, what are you ready for? He goes, I think I can do this. I think I can become a pop artist. And I think I've got everything that I need to do it. And I just need to uh, collaborate with somebody. And we went on to do a tremendous amount of business where he's our top selling artist on the platform. We just had an art show with him at Spotlight that's completely sold out, $10,000 paintings, no problem. Um, he DJs, he performed, he had a live performance with his band. Like it's all these layers of creativity that we were able to kind of see in this relationship with Shifi. And, you know, right now things are real slow you know, with, with our collaboration. Like, I feel like he's kind of going up the escalator and he's getting to a point where he's now kind of self-sustaining and he's arriving at this place um, where it's like, maybe he doesn't need our help so much anymore. So that's been one of the most dynamic relationships we've had lately. And I think, you know, as we've kind of learned is that um, sometimes the, the, the kids leave the nest you know, and, uh, and watching them, watching them fly away and, and have success is, is the most rewarding part of what we do. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there, you know, there's a lot of kind of people in the pipeline, um, you know, of upcoming projects. I think, uh, one I'm really excited about too is natural. You know, we've, we've had a kind of a long working relationship with him and we've done, you know, amazing prints over the years and murals around the world with him and, um, really done some cool stuff, but you know, on this NFT, he was our, our first, uh, rare drop when we dropped all these card holders. And I think he just has so many ideas and the ideas he's thinking about are, I don't know, so forward thinking on just what the technology and what our platform could do for the artist as a whole, not just how we could make some money off, you know, dropping a batch of NFTs that like, I don't know. Every time, every call we have with him on, on some of these projects we're working on, it's just like, I get a million new ideas and I just keep the, the picture just keeps expanding in my head of like what is possible. Um, so from that standpoint, I man, it's been kind of 
inspiration with him and on some of the, the project he has in the works. So I think what's what's old is new again for us, right? Because we can rephrase everything in, in a new way. And so that's that's really been uh, super inspiring. Look, two years ago, we only had paper and original art to sell. And, and, and now we have this entire open dynamic, uh, uh, uncharted waters of, of ideas. And, and I think uh, you'll see um, the dynamic nature of art that will be created in the years to come will be so fun and artists will really start to spread their wings. And cause it's like, uh, you know, a key, it opens up the box and it's like, Oh my God, wait, I can, if this equals that, then this becomes something different. And so I think through the act of observation, ultimately like artists are going to make so much more dynamic artwork that they wouldn't been able to make in the past. The only hiccup is you need, you know, a programmer sometimes, but they're also making that um, easier to come by through applications. But yeah, I think that we're, we're, we're right in the prime. Um, we're in a great headspace and we're just so excited about the opportunities that exist. And um, yeah, we should really thank, uh, you know, Evan, your commitment to what we've done over the years and your support and, and Mike and, and everybody at Juxtapose has been such, such great supporters of what we did. And look, we're, we're, we come from Juxtapose. Our visual vocabulary comes from Juxtapose. Like we wouldn't know half of what we are if it wasn't for picking up the magazine and being inspired. And so for the person who picks up their first magazine today, we're going to inspire the next generation forward. I, you know what? It's so awesome that you said that because actually I was saying this to my parents this morning, like how I've now done juxtapose for almost 16 years. I've been there for almost 16 years and there's such a new crop of artists that excite me right now that like are, are, that I'm learning about like every day. And I, it, I feel like what's old is new, kind of what you're saying I've, a little bit, how like, I just feel like, Oh my God, there's, there's so many more stories to tell. Like, this is so, this is so fun. I am having more fun now than I've ever had before. Cause I feel like there's such a new crop of people that excite me. And then all, and then on top of that artists that I've known forever who are doing new things that excite me. So I, I think I agree with everything you're saying. How, a question for you. How do you, I'm, every time I pick up Juxtapose, I'm shocked that 90% of the artists I've never heard of. Where do you find them? Like, how do you, where is this rock? <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, it's so dynamic. Well, you know, the thing is, it's because I think it's the, the escalator thing you're talking about is actually what is very much part of what we do. Like we try to find artists that are at the peak, peak pinnacle of what they're doing in terms of financial success and critical acclaim and, uh, solo shows around the world. And then we try to find the person who is just starting. And when you put all that together, you actually start creating stories that no one else is really telling because it's really difficult because in terms of a physical product that you can sell to people, uh, you have all these stories that make up what's actually happening in the art world as opposed to just one part of it, which is basically the auction houses or whatever. But where do we find people? We just have really, I mean, I'm so lucky. I have conversations with just some of the best minds of people who are looking at the art world. And I just, I just am constantly looking and observing and going. I mean, I, I go to more art shows than I think I've ever gone to before. I've been so lucky because I've been splitting time between lots of different places recently. And it's just going places, just going and looking and, and observing. That's really it. So there you go. That was it. Juxtapose Magazine's Evan Preco in conversation with One Time Runs, Jesse Corey and Dan Armand. If you enjoyed today's episode, please make sure you like, share, subscribe, leave us a comment somewhere. I don't know where, anywhere. It doesn't really matter. Just think a nice thought about us and that'll be enough. Today's episode was edited by myself, Doug Gillen. All the music today was supplied by Artlist, apart from that track halfway through, which was the Habibi Funk remix of Ya and Dali by Najib Alush. We're going to be back with you real soon. Hopefully Evan and myself together on the same episode. What a sweet thing that would be. Till then, take care of yourselves and each other.